13 this morning. Now concerning things to idols, <clears throat> we know that we all have knowledge. The knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not con commend us to God, and we neither the worse if we eat of it, nor if we do not eat of it. But take care that at this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother whose sake Christ died. And also, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble." This morning we're going to do a little bit of a bridge, moving from chapter 7 to chapter 8. There's some things I want to go back and look at in earlier sections as we move to this section this morning in, in this letter of 1 Corinthians. I have to tell you, when I first started 1 Corinthians, I, I took this class in college. And then I took 1 Corinthians exegesis class with my dad at seminary. And I thought, you know, this is going to be easy. I know this book. I've gone through it and studied it and done work on it, so this will be easy. But it's not that easy. I, first, Second Corinthians has got to be two of the toughest books in the New Testament to handle. I can handle Romans. I can handle the abstracts of Ephesians and Colossians. But for some reason, First and Second Corinthians, they're just tough books. And I, I can't prove this, but in Second Peter chapter three, verse sixteen, Peter refers to the letters of Paul. And he says he writes some hard things to understand. I believe that Peter was thinking about 1 and 2 Corinthians when he wrote that, because they are tough. And every time I, I feel like when I move to another chapter, I think, okay, this one's going to be easier than the last one. And then I move into it, and I'm like, no, it's not any easier. And I find myself getting pushed up against traditional interpretations of these passages that we've been looking at. And challenging, really, are they really teaching that? And tradition is good. And a lot of the interpretations that we hang on to from the early church are good. And just because they're older, they shouldn't be cast out for something new. But at the same time, we should be willing to weigh them according to the text and see if they stand or if they fall. And as I've gone through 1 Corinthians, some of the things that I thought it was teaching, I realized I didn't really get a grasp of it the first time or the second time through, but I'm understanding it now. And so we started to look at 1 Corinthians, and we saw that there were divisions in God's church. And this was Paul's concern. He started off in chapter 1, verse 10, and this runs through the end of chapter 4. And the reason he starts with this is because of the influence that these divisions have throughout the body. And the report came to him from some of Chloe's people that there was division in the church, and Paul needed to address this issue. And it's interesting that when we started to look at that, I asked myself, why does Paul start with this first? Because there are more serious sins that he deals with, say, in chapter 5, the immorality and that. Why doesn't he start there? Because they seem so much more grievous than just merely divisions. But as I go through the letter, I'm realizing over and over, and it's just being more solidified in my mind, that he started there because the divisions just didn't stop there. They ran through the whole entire letter. So there was division in the church because of immorality, of going to law before the unbeliever or the heathen. There was division in regards to marriage and one's understanding of, of the different issues that they were wrestling with. Meats offered to idols, conduct of women in the church, the Lord's Supper, over and over. There was divisiveness in all of these areas. And that's why he starts first. The other thing that's interesting is that when he starts with divisions first, he starts off with the power of the cross. 
because he realizes that there was an underlying element to all of this divisiveness and it was self-centeredness. And it's at the cross where we die to self and we live to God. So he starts off in chapter 1, verse 18, dealing with the cross of Christ. And I tell you that that lays the groundwork for everything that is going to flow through the rest of this letter. But remember, Paul's trying to get them to think the same things. And this is what's struggling for me sometimes going through 1 Corinthians because this is what he said he wanted to happen. In chapter 1, verse 10, he says, There are divisions in the church, therefore I want you to have the same mindset and the same judgment that flows out of that mindset, right? So we need to have the, the mind of God in all of these issues. My struggle is then why in the world can't you write them a little bit clearer than you have been? Because I'm walking through them and they're not that easy. And some of them aren't that clear. And I'm thinking, if you really want us to get it and have the same mindset, couldn't it be easier for us? But I'm finding that things that we learn, sometimes they just take time. They take time to take root in our hearts and minds as we go through them and, and meditate on them and ponder them. Some things are going to take a while. And Paul ended that first section, chapter 4, verse 14, he says, I'm not writing these things to shame you, but to correct you. And this word, nuthetao, is I want to plant in your mind these things so that you will change your thinking on them. And hopefully that's what's happening to all of us as we walk through this letter, that our, our minds are changing in regards to certain issues. And when we get to chapters 5 and 6, when he deals with the immorality and the condemnation of it, remember over and over he kept asking the same question through these chapters. Do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? And what he's trying to do is to get them to understand. And these were things that they should have known. And he's trying to get their minds wrapped around these things. These things should not be in the church. You need to deal with this immorality. And it's something that they just were not doing. Now, the reason why I go back to this is because it's interesting. Notice chapter 8, verse 1. He says, now concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that we have knowledge. Now, this statement, we know, is a different term for knowledge than the second one. The first term he uses here in verse 8 when he says, we know, is oidomen, which is related to this word oidete that he uses in, in chapters 5 and 6. So he's going to talk again about things that we know, and he's going to talk about our knowledge. Now, it's interesting because he's going to introduce another word for knowledge here, gnosis. It's where we get our English word kno, right? K-N-O-W. I know it's not pronounced that way, but linguistically. But we have in Greek G-N-O, gno, and that's where we get our word know from. So he is calling upon them to understand, and he's, he's challenging their, their knowledge and what they think that they know. Or do they really know what they know? And so he's going to push this as he goes through this chapter, verse 8, as he sets the stage for what is to come. But over and over, he's trying to get us to think the same things. And what's intriguing about this is that these are things that need to happen fast. So he keeps stirring up their minds. You need to get your mind straight on this. But other things are going to take time. So notice in chapter 8, it's interesting because in chapter 8, he refers to those who have knowledge. And then he refers to the weaker brother. And these who have knowledge realize that there is no such thing as idols. This food sacrifice him doesn't really matter. It doesn't commend us to God. And so in verse 10 of chapter 8, he addresses a particular issue that is happening there. And he says, For if some sees you who have knowledge dining in the idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? The implication by this verse is that there are those who understand these things. They're in the know. They know that these idols are nothing. And what they're doing is they're taking these weaker brethren into the temple and they're eating this meat before them and trying to strengthen them when actually they're really weakening them. And Paul's going to say, look, you have a knowledge, but you have to be careful how you apply that knowledge. And in chapter 10, he's going to challenge them. Look, don't change your convictions. I don't want that to alter. What you need to do is alter your behavior in certain circumstances in regards to these weaker brothers. So there are some things that we need to know and we need to know now and deal with. There's other things that we know that over time, they will come around and we will come to understand them. And so will the weaker brethren who don't understand these truths. So Paul and takes us into chapter 7. And this is a section in which he is addressing issues in a letter. And there were questions that were raised to Paul and so he is going to address them. And we finish chapter 7 together. And now we're moving into chapter 8, but chapter 7, I have to look at this for a second, okay? So I'm going to do this for you. I don't think in this chapter that Paul is dealing with anything in the sense of divorce and remarriage like we would understand it. Many want to come here and do that. So I'm going to do this for you, and I don't typically do this, but I do if there are, are varying views on something. I, I 
put them out there for you to deal with and to, and to ponder on. But it's interesting, in chapter 7, verse 15, it says this, Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now, in this particular section, we know that Paul is dealing with two people who are unbelievers. One is called to salvation. Now you have an unbeliever and a believer who are married. And he says, if the unbeliever wants to leave, right, and you cannot keep the peace, let them go. Okay? Now, some take this statement that they are not under bondage in such cases. They take this as being equivalent to the statement in verse 39 when Paul talks about the wife who is bound as long as her husband lives, but once he has died, then she is free to remarry again. So some take these two statements as being exactly the same. So what they say is that, okay, if you're married and you're a believer and unbeliever, an unbeliever leaves, that believer then is now free to remarry again, okay? So I'll just tell you this. I don't think that that's in this passage. Part of the reason I don't think it's here is because I don't see it here. In other words, you look at the other concessions that Paul gives in chapter 7, like with the widows and widowers. He tells them in, in verse 9, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry again, right? So he gives these concessions in these other areas, but he doesn't do that in verse 15. And you would think that he would if the believer after the unbeliever leaves is free to remarry. You'd think he would say that that's okay. They can go ahead and do that if they want to. Okay? But he doesn't say that. The other thing is that it's difficult for me when I look at this passage because the word in verse 15 is not the same word as in verse 39. They're two totally different words. So I believe that in verse 15 when he says that they are not under bondage anymore is that they are released from the obligations and the duties that come with marriage as he already addressed them in, in verses 3 through 6 earlier on. Okay? So I just have to tell you that. But there are some who hold that that frees up then the believer to remarry again. I don't think so. It's hard for me to see that in the text, but I just have to tell you that. And why I tell you that is because some of these passages we all just have to wrestle with. Okay? So I just put that out there for you. And I don't know who holds what. Now people ask me, well, you know, what, what view does MacArthur hold? I, I don't know. I don't know, and I'm... In, in all honesty, I'm not trying to line up with where he is. I'm just trying to discern the meaning of the text itself, right? So if he makes a statement, he says, in all of this is not to say that Paul disallows remarriage in such cases. He simply does not speak to it at all. Thus, this text offers little help for the very real contemporary concern. All right, so I leave this for you to ponder. Okay? But that's just where I stand in that issue. So Paul is dealing with the issue of marriage. He's going to deal with the issue of spiritual gifts in chapter 12 through 14. And I leave out this section for a reason. And then chapter 15 is going to deal with the resurrection. And then the collection for the poor in chapter 16. But here's a section we're moving into. Chapter 8 verses 1. And I believe runs all the way to the end of chapter 11. So I have to tell you that already I'm, I'm pushing against tradition here. Because normally this section isn't looked upon as going that far. Usually when you look at people who, who dress this section of, of 1 Corinthians, they ended at chapter 11, verse 1. Okay? But I think it stretched farther than that. So let me just lay some things. We come to chapter 8 for you. And we're only going to get into the first line of chapter 8. So just don't sweat it, right? And thinking, oh, we got to get to the whole chapter. No. All right, so, and I don't, see this thing, I don't want you to take my word for it, okay? So I, I have to, so if there's times where I've taken a view that's other than what people traditionally take, I give you from the context my reasons why, right? So then you can go to the context and determine whether I'm speaking the truth or not speaking the truth. And that's why we put it all up here, stick to the text, lay it out, okay? So you can call me on it. Tell me, Brother Steve, you're way off the bat, okay? That's cool. I can handle that. So here's the thing. So I'm going to give you the groundwork. So it's clear. If you look with me in your Bibles, chapter 8, verse 1, he talks about things uh, concerning things sacrificed to idols. Now, we can jump to chapter 10, verse 14, and notice in verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. So we see a connection between these two sections, chapter 8 and chapter 10, verses 14, and it runs into 11, 1. And it's interesting because if you look at 11, 1, which in NASB, they put it with chapter 11. Others, they put it up there with chapter 10. But he ends, be imitators of me, just as also I am of Christ. And that closes that section, some think. 
So we can see the related issues where we have sacrifice to idols and then idolatry. So we see that connection, right? But here's the thing. But when you get to chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, 13, it seems to have nothing to do with these two things, idolatry. Notice with me. And we'll start in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 9. Paul says this, Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do not do only Barnabas and I have the right to refrain from working? So he's going to go in to talk about his apostleship. And you can look at that and say, well, what does that have to do with these two in sections? Chapter 8 and chapter 10. Right? As my father would say, what does this have to do with the price of eggs in Denmark? Absolutely nothing, but it has everything to do with this context. And as we walk through, we'll see it's integral to Paul's argument, because actually he's going to use his life as an example for what he starts to address in chapter 8. So in chapter 8, verse 1 through 13, he's going to introduce the problem. He's going to deal with food sacrifice to idols. He's going to give a solution. He's going to lay down the principle. Then in chapter 9, verse 1 through 18, he is going to apply this principle to his life. And he's also going to talk about it in relation to accepting money for ministry. Love this passage. Love this passage. He has the right to do that, to make a living off the gospel. He chooses not to, but that's his choice, to do or not to do. So he's going to use his own life as an example. And he's going, so interesting. So we saw in chapter 7 where Paul took this principle and he applied it to different things. He's going to do the same thing here, but even broader. So now we're going to see that there's going to be a principle that runs all the way through here that he's going to address and deal with. But he starts it off in chapter 8, verse 1 through 13. Then in chapter 9, verses 19 through 27, and we all know this passage pretty well, but here he's going to generalize it even further as he talks about his ministry, the gospel, and reaching the lost. And in verses 22 and 23, he says, I have become all things to all people so that by all means I may save some. So he's going to carry the principle all the way down into that. So I believe that all the way through here, what he's dealing with is Christian liberty. All the way through this section into chapter 11 to the end. Then he's going to move to chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. And he's going to use the nation of Israel as an example of not allowing your freedom to turn into a license for immorality. And twice, he refers to them as being an example for us. So Paul's going to say, exhibit A is me, exhibit B is the nation of Israel. Okay, And that's going to lead him into chapter 11. So it's going to seem like when he gets to chapter 10, verses 14 through 22, and then 10, 23 through 11, it looks like he's going to bring things to a close. I think that they extend even further than that. Okay, so I'll elaborate on that in just a little bit. So I believe that in this section, he is dealing with from 8.1 to 11.34, Christian liberty. He's dealing with Christian liberty. So I put this all here for you so that you can go back and read through the context and see for yourself. But these are things that I'm wrestling with. And I realize that I'm pushing boundaries a little bit, but I'm just, right, just letting the, the path lead me where it does. Yeah? So we'll pull these pieces together. So this is the issue we're dealing with, Christian liberty. And we're going to start here in chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, knowledge and love. We're not even going to get into that because Paul's going to raise the issue in chapter 8, verse 1, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. And this gets us started. And I give you verse 10 because this broadens it and it helps us understand the issue of this knowledge and love and how important it is for us to understand this truth. There is knowledge, but we must have love as we apply this truth to our lives. Okay? And as we see the life situation that Paul is going to draw on, but it's interesting because as soon as he addresses this issue and he talks about things sacrificed to idols, this busts him into this long, extensive response to it. And I'm sure it's going a lot longer than the Corinthians thought it would go. And he's going to touch in all these other areas, and he's even going to get into their own worship themselves in chapter 11, women's head covering and partaking of the Lord's Supper and all those things. I think that's all a part of what he's going to address here. So he addresses this subject, but then all of a sudden he goes into this long thing. You start asking yourself, well, why so long on this issue? Because otherwise we've had a chapter, a chapter, a chapter, and now all of a sudden we have this big section dealing with one thing, and I think it's because he understood that underneath this was their self-centeredness, again, raising itself up. And notice how he makes a statement that knowledge puffs up. He comes back to the issue of arrogance again, but love edifies. I think the reason that why Paul comes and he addresses this and so extended is because he sees that this is another manifestation of their self-centeredness. It's interesting what pride can do, isn't it? 
And it's interesting to me, like all the different ways that it will manifest itself and all the different conflicts, they stem from that issue of pride and self-centeredness. You go back to even chapter three and the strife there, the word that he uses for strife, it has to do with self-centered conflict that is in the church. Even when they were fighting over leaders, they were self-centered in that. You know, they're focusing their attention on individuals. And so Paul says, this is another case of that. So let me show you what happens. Two words that I think epitomize the Corinthians' view here that Paul is going to deal with. And the first one is freedom, and the second one is rights. He's going to touch on this in chapter 9, verse 1. He says, am I not free? And this is going to lead him into talking about his apostleship and the issue of freedom. He's going to come back to this again in chapter 10, verses 29. He's going to address the rights that we have. In chapter 8, verse 9, it's interesting because notice with me, but take care that this liberty, this is the same word in Greek, exousia, it's translated liberty, everywhere else it is freedom. And he's going to carry this into chapter 9. They're concerned about their freedom and the rights. This is very American. We can understand this. When it comes to the sacrifices to idols, we don't get that so much because we don't do that here. Western mind can't wrap around that, but we can understand this because everything in this country is about our freedom and our rights. Not saying that we don't have them and that they aren't there, right? But sometimes we have a tendency to bring the Americanness into the church. And sometimes it's hard for us to distinguish what is American, what is Christian. And sometimes I find myself asking myself that and asking others, we have conversations, is that an American view or is that a Christian view? So we understand this very well and they were, they were concerned with their rights. I have the right to do this, I have the right to do that, I can go eat here, I can eat there, I can do this, do that. And they're having an impact upon the weaker brethren who don't have the understanding that they have. They're fighting for the rights. And I'll just say this again, when we talked about the issue of Christian liberty in chapter 6, if it is a liberty, right, if it's something that is truly a liberty, you can take it or leave it, right? If you can't take or leave that thing, then you have to rethink, is this really something I need to let go of because maybe it's something that has a little bit of mastery over me. Notice Paul's statement in chapter 8, verse 13, and I, I think he's going way overboard with this. But notice verse 13, and this is a voluntary response to this issue of freedom and rights. He says, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. He uses a double negative here, ume in the Greek text. I will never do this again. Now, I think he's going a little too far. And probably Paul has not tasted a slow-cooked tri-tip on the grill. <laughs> but he says, look, I'm, if it's going to cause my brother to stumble, I'm willing to let this go. And if it's a freedom, we can do that. Take it or leave it. I don't care, right? But if we can't say that, then we need to stop and ask ourselves, is this a problem for us? And awfully, it was a problem for them, and it was affecting the church. So Paul is going to take these two terms, and he's going to qualify them. And he's going to qualify them in regards to love for others and seeking their good. Now, I love this. Notice with me, chapter 10, verse 24. He says, let no one seek his own good. Notice it's in italics. He takes that from verse 23 but that of his neighbor. So let not one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Seek his neighbor's good. And again, he's still talking about rights and freedom and so on. And he borrows the word. It's in italics here in verse 24. He borrows it from verse 23 and is the word profitable. And we find that that will run through chapter 10 and even to chapter 12, dealing with spiritual gifts. In other words, you need to, out of love, you need to seek that which is good for the other or beneficial or profitable for the other one. And I love this word, sumpero. The, the first part, first part of the word is the, the preposition soon, means together with. And pero means to bring together, to bring together. And we do this by strengthening and building them up. So in chapter 8, verse 1, notice what he says. He says, knowledge puffs up, but arrogant, but love edifies. Now this is beautiful. This is the term it's translated. This is the term oikadameo. It is to build up, to strengthen. And through here, it's going to be translated edifies. This word is going to be carried into chapter 10 and then into chapter 14 as he talks about spiritual gifts. They're about the edification of the body. Everything is about building up of the body. So here's what's interesting in chapter 8, verse 10. He is going to use the same word. Now, everywhere else he uses it positively except for 8, 10. So notice with me verse 10 of chapter 8. He says, For if someone weak sees you who possess knowledge dining in an idol's temple... 
Will not his conscience be strengthened to eat food offered to idols? Now this word strengthen, it's that word of karamel, which he uses very positively, that edification, that building up. But here he's going to use it in an ironic way. In other words, the weak person is built up to commit what he regards as sin. In other words, we have a demolition calling itself edification. He says, you're doing this for their edification, but actually you're destroying them. Notice verse 11. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is what? He's ruined. He's ruined. You think by your actions you're building up the weaker brother. Actually, what you're doing is you're destroying him. You're destroying him. It would almost be likened to the sense if you have someone who, who has been addicted to alcohol for years and then they come off it, and then you have someone in the church says, well, I have freedom to drink, and what they do is they take that person who is wrestling with that and coming off of that, saying, oh, but you're free, it's okay, here, drink up, right? And, and handing them a glass of wine or a beer. He says it's essentially the same thing. So it's something for us then to stop and consider and look. We, we know things that, that we have rights and freedom in. We must be cautious. Sometimes our knowledge, we don't apply it the same way every time. And Paul isn't saying give up your convictions, but what he's saying is you need to alter your behavior for those in the body because we are a body. We are a community, and we are to be building each other up, right, in the faith. And he says what they're doing is actually tearing it down. So he's going to take these two themes then through the section, me first, you first. And he's going to develop them, and he's going to develop them in relation to pagan worship and Christian worship. And this is what unifies these two chapters together. And that's why I think it runs in to the end of chapter 11. Secondarily, Paul's going to show that this whole idea of me first kind of attitude ultimately brings God's disapproval and his discipline. This is word akadamos. It's interesting because dokimos, it has, dokimos has the idea of to test and then approve. And then he puts this alpha privative on the front of it and negates it. God has looked at you, he has tested you, and he's put a stamp of disapproval on your actions. And therefore, you're going to be disciplined by that. So that is the issue as Paul raises it. And he is going to address the issue now and regarding the things sacrificed to idols. So I just tell you, I bring those things out to tell you that when he deals with these things, there are underlying issues there. And when we deal with people in sin, we have to remember this. Or even when we're trying to strengthen the brethren, help them grow. When we look at their life, we've got to understand that the things that they do, there are underlying reasons for why they do what they do. And so often we're always about the symptoms. We never get to the root cause of why these things are manifesting themselves. And we do this when we go to the doctor. We come, we say, we have these symptoms. What's the root cause? Because we know we can deal with the symptoms, but the cause doesn't go away. So the symptoms are going to keep coming again. You see what I'm saying? So Paul understands underneath all of this, he knows what's flowing here. It's their self-centeredness. It's their pride. Right? So he is keeping that in mind as he's dealing with these issues as he walks through this passage together. So it's much deeper than what seems to be on the surface. And this is why I struggle so much with 1 Corinthians. There's so much involved in these things that Paul is dealing with. But I'll just tell you, 1 Corinthians is a letter that every church today needs to study thoroughly. It is for this day, without a doubt. So Paul is going to address this topic, and it's introduced with now, now regarding parody day. Now, it's interesting because he does this. So he did this in chapter 7, verse 1. Notice with me. He says, now concerning, in our English text, he carries that, peri de. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, now concerning, he does this again. Notice when it happens again. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. So this starts a new section. So again, I believe that this whole section runs to 1134. But notice what happens. He doesn't come back to it again until chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning peri de. But verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 1, he's going to use the word now. So this leaves a question. Does verse chapter 15 go with 12 through 14, or is it a new section? It's an interesting thought to me. So I'm pondering this, and we'll get to that when we get there, but just to plant a seed in your head, right? And we'll just keep watering as we go along. So all the way through here, peri de, peri de. Every time he does that, he's addressing a new issue that they raise in a letter. So this starts it, and it runs to the end of chapter 11. And he's going to talk about things sacrificed to idols. Now this particular term here, some have translated, like in ASB, you notice, now things 
sacrificed idols, they translated things. What are they talking about? Later, we get in chapter 8, we realize he's talking about food. Then we get to verse 13, we finally say about well, meat, right? So finally, we get to what is the things that he's talking about. Well, actually, that understanding is contained in the word that he uses here. And it's interesting because this word is made up of two parts. Ados, which means the, the visual or the appearance of the outward appearance of something. And then thuo is to slaughter or to sacrifice. It is that which is sacrificed or slaughtered to this image or this appearance of things. So it is this idol that they have created. And it's related to the word in chapter 10 verse 14 for idolatry. And there it's ados, which is this image, if you will. And then latruo. The verb is to worship, and so idolatry is the worship of these images, these visual things that they set before them and call them deities or gods. So Paul says, I'm going to address this issue. Now, have to understand what's at the base of this. Most of the meat sold in the town marketplace came from the sacrificial animals that were offered in these pagan temples and these ceremonies. And so the, oftentimes what they do is they take the worst part of the, the meat and they would, they would offer it in the sacrifice. And then the best parts, they would take the marketplace and they would sell and people would come and buy them. Which is very interesting to me. They're going to offer up to appease their gods again the worst part, right? And then take the best part for themselves. Something a little reminiscent about what happened in the Old Testament, right? With Eli's boys. Yeah? Food for thought. Just food for thought on that. But obviously this is going to raise questions for the church. Now we don't understand this kind of thing because we don't offer up sacrifices. But this is going to raise questions in their head. And they're going to ask things like, did these rituals somehow automatically taint the food? Can we now not eat it? Right? Some believe that what they believe, what there were demons in the meat, and therefore it had to be sacrificed to purge the meat of the demons, and then they could eat it. They would ask questions, could Christians buy this in the marketplace? Could we eat this if it's offered to us at a, at a friend's house? If we're invited over for dinner, can we do this? Can we attend these social events in these, in these temples, these weddings and parties that they would hold, and all the festivities? Can we go there? Can we eat the things that are set before us? Are we allowed to do this? I mean, these are questions that they're going to ask. These aren't things that we would ask. We don't understand this. We don't understand this. And somehow we sort of try to get our mind worked around this, but this was their issue. Here is this meat offered up in these temples. Now it's sold in the marketplace. Can we eat this? It is it okay, right? It's interesting in New Zealand, the vast majority of their, their sheep and their cattle are slaughtered and they're bought by Muslims. So it's worked out that when they do this, right, they have to, they have to do that when the sheep and the cattle are facing towards Mecca before they slaughter them. That way then they're appropriate for Muslims to use. And it's interesting that I encountered this guy down in Portland, had a food truck, he was a Muslim fellow, and I ordered this uh, lamb kebab and it was having a good time talking with him about his belief and so on. But I asked him about the lamb. I said, where do you find it? He said, well, I buy it at Costco. So you either have those who get it from, from New Zealand and it's aimed towards Mecca, or you get it from Costco, whatever it is. But they had to have it done in a certain way. And for other people, they understand this. In other parts of the world, they understand this. We don't get this in the Western world. We just don't do these kinds of things. If I order a Tillamook cheeseburger, I don't care which way they're facing, so long as they wash their hands and it's fresh, right? So it's hard for us to get in this mindset. But these are things that they're wrestling with. And there may be other things that we can think of in our life, more contemporary, of issues that we wrestle with. Are we free to do this or are we not? But obviously this is a, a huge thing for them. And, and the issue goes farther than that because there are three things essentially that Paul is going to do. He's going to sum them up and he's going to address three things. First, the acceptability of buying and eating meat from one of these sacrificial animals. That's one of the things he's going to address here through these chapters. So if you want to write these down, come back and we'll walk through and see these particular things. The other thing is you can address the acceptability of eating this meat as an invited guest in a friend's home. And well, what's interesting is he doesn't get those, notice chapter 10 with me. Chapter 10 verses 23 and following. He says in 10.23, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the market. Right? So eat anything that's sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. Notice verse 27. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. 
it isn't until chapter 10, verses 23 and following, that he's going to talk about these two things. So then what is he going to talk about in chapter 8? Some, traditionally, the view is that in chapter 8, he's talking about, can a Christian go to the meat market, buy this meat, and bring it home and eat it? No, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about actually eating the meat in the temple with the festivities that are going on. That's what he's addressing, verse 10 of chapter 8. So, this is my reason. I'm, I'm pushing against tradition here a little bit, but just to tell you, this is my reason why. So in chapter 8, then, he's going to address the issue of the acceptability of attending one of these pagan sacrifices and enjoying the meat of celebration which followed in the temple precincts. And they were bringing weak brethren into these things, and they were seeing what was happening. Because notice he doesn't say in verse 10, he doesn't say in verse 10 that the weak brother discovers or hears. He says if the weak brother sees you, well, how is he going to see you if he isn't there? Right? So I believe that they are trying to strengthen these weak brethren. They're bringing them into the temple precincts. They're forcing them to be a part of these things and to eat this stuff when in their conscience it's saying, no, I can't. This is sin. And what they're doing is they're just hardening them towards that sin rather than building them up. Their actions find to be destructive rather than constructive. Next Sunday, come with me and we'll walk and talk about the relationship of love to knowledge and that there is a need for love with knowledge. Oftentimes we think that when we grow, we need to know, and that is absolutely true. We need to know to grow, but we'll find that the virtue of love is crucial to that happening. Dad, would you close in word of prayer?